think of the best players of the 2010s. Go. Mike Trout, duh. Joey Votto, Andrew McCutcheon, Buster Posey, Miguel Cabrera, all guys that will merit serious consideration for the Hall of Fame. But one you might not think of is Ben Zobrist, utility man extraordinaire. But at his peak from 2009 to 2016, Zobrist was a top 10 player in baseball, but like all role players, never got his due as one of the stars of the game. So in my new series, Underappreciated Players, let's celebrate the career of Ben Zobrist. He grew up in the small town of Eureka, Illinois. His father was a pastor, and Ben was a total non-prospect coming out of high school. His plan was to join the church himself, but his high school baseball coach encouraged Ben to go to a showcase in Peoria, Illinois, where he got an offer to play baseball at Division III Olivet Nazareth University. Zobrist was a star for the Tigers and ended up getting drafted in the sixth round by the Astros, who then traded him to the Rays for Aubrey Huff. At the time, Zobrist was strictly a shortstop, and he debuted in the majors in 2006. He sucked. He was the second worst player in baseball from 2006 to 2007. He was a 200 hitter with no plate discipline or power and below average defense at short, so a change was definitely in order. In the offseason, he hired a swing coach that fixed some of the hitches in his swing, and would finally get to see some more consistent at-bats being shifted to a utility role. In 2008, Zobrist was Tampa's backup shortstop, but also their fourth outfielder and a backup second and third baseman, all while having his best season so far at the plate with a 123 WRC+. This earned him a starting job in 2009, splitting his time between second and right. Zobrist's success was a big reason the Rays had their first winning season in franchise history, but when it came down to Tampa Bay's first postseason appearance, Zobrist was underwhelming with just one hit and 13 plate appearances. In 2009, though, Zobrist was a revelation, with an outstanding 152 WRC+, and excellent defense between his many positions. Zobrist had an elite 15% walk rate and solid strikeout rate, which gave him a 405 on base percentage sandwiched right between Derek Jeter and Alex Rodriguez. Zobrist's staggering 8.7 F4 was one of the best figures in the league. Scratch that, it was the best figure in the league. Better than peak seasons from Albert Pujols, Joe Maurer, Chase Utley, Derek Jeter, and Troy Tulowitzki. In fact, Ben Zobrist's 2009 was better in terms of F4 than any season for any of the players I just mentioned except Pujols. Maurer ended up winning the AL MVP that year, which was very defensible, but in hindsight, Zobrist finished just 8th in the voting but definitely could have won. Whenever the topic of utility guys comes up though, I'd be remiss not to mention that their value goes beyond war calculations. Even if Ben Zobrist and, say, Chase Utley had identical stats in every facet, Zobrist is inherently more valuable because he has the experience and willingness to play a multitude of positions, whereas Utley only plays one. Zobrist's flexibility allowed Joe Madden to build the best lineup every day for the pitching matchup and get all his other players rested. If you want a more in-depth look at the value of positional flexibility, then you might like my Kike Hernandez video, which I'll link in the description. So Zobrist was electric in 2009, but he never quite reached those peaks again. By 2010, he was already 29 years old, so Zobrist would need a graceful decline to be looked at as a successful major leaguer. And a graceful decline he had, if you could even call it a decline. The follow-up to his MVP season was just a 100 WRC plus in 2010, with a respectable but unremarkable 3.8 war, but he bounced back in 2011 with an all-star level 130 WRC plus and 6.4 F war. In 2012, Zobrist had his second best career season at the plate with a 137 WRC plus. In fact, from 2009 to 2012, Zobrist's 24.7 F4 was second in all of baseball, just a hair behind Miguel Cabrera. Zobrist was obviously a far inferior hitter to Cabrera, but a lot of his value came from his defense, which was consistently excellent at second and in the corner outfield, and was serviceable at short and center, and the fact he was a good base runner. Zobrist wasn't especially fast, but he had good instincts for taking extra bases and stealing bags on breaking balls. Basically, Zobrist was a great, if not quite, elite hitter that did all the little things right, and was willing to take on any role for the team, which allowed him to accumulate value in a lot of different ways. While 2009-2012 to was definitely Zobrist's peak, Ben was still productive pretty much the rest of his career. From 2013 to 2018, or from his age 32 to 37 seasons, Zobrist had a very solid 115 WRC+, and averaged more than 3 war a season, making him a well above average player. He wasn't perennially an all-star caliber player anymore, but in this time frame, he was only behind Adrian Beltre and Nelson Cruz in war for players 32 and older. He did all this while bringing his signature flexibility to every team he was on and being a calming veteran presence in the locker room. 
And that is the final piece that makes Ben Zobra's career so remarkable, his contribution to two World Series championships. In 2015, the last year of his contract with the Rays, Zobrist was traded to Oakland. Then, at the deadline, he was flipped again to Kansas City for Sean Manaya. Zobrist slotted in immediately as the Royals' starting second baseman and delivered a 124 WRC plus for them down the stretch. And he came up big in the playoffs with a 1050 OPS against the Blue Jays in the ALCS and an 860 OPS in 75 postseason plate appearances. In the World Series, Zobrist had several clutch hits including putting the winning run in scoring position with a single in the 14th inning of Game 1. This led to him accruing a 15.89% championship win percentage added, which is a context-based stat meaning Zobris was directly responsible for increasing the Royals' chance to win the World Series by about 16%. This figure was the highest of any player for either team in the series, meaning that although Salvador Perez won Series MVP for his superior batting stats, Zobris was better in the clutch so he was also potentially deserving of the award. In 2016, Zobris converted his success into a four-year, $56 million deal with the Cubs. If the overly simplified $8 million for one war free agency break-even is to be believed, then Zobrist was more productive than expected over the length of this deal with 8.4 F4. But without a doubt, Zobrist's biggest contribution to Chicago was his work in the 2016 World Series. It isn't a stretch to say that without him, the Cubs would still be in the midst of the longest drought in sports. He had a 357 average and 919 OPS in the epic series, culminating in maybe the biggest hit by anyone in the past decade. With runners on first and second and one out in the 10th inning of the tied Game 7, Ben Zobra stepped in against Brian Shaw. The at-bat had a championship leverage index of 768, which is absolutely off the charts. For context, an average at-bat during the regular season has a championship leverage index of... 1. And the 768 leverage in this at-bat was the highest for any single at-bat the entire season, making it the biggest moment in the biggest game of the biggest World Series of the decade. He shot a grander down the left field line, driving in the go-ahead run, and moving the eventual winning run to third base. It single-handedly increased Chicago's chance to win the World Series from 58% to 89%, the biggest swing of the series other than Rajay Davis's home run. The hit secured Chicago their first title in more than 100 years and secured Zobrist World Series MVP honors and a spot in the hearts of Cubs fans forever. As far as I can tell, Zobrist is the only player to win the World Series in back-to-back -back years for an AL team and an NL team, which carves him a unique niche in baseball's long history. For the rest of his career, Zobrist was a slightly below average hitter and defender, but in 2018 he turned back the clock and had one more successful season, picking a good year to do it since the Cubs ended the season tied for the lead in the NL Central. He finished with a 305 average, 123 WRC+, and 3.7 F4, second for any player on the Cubs. Finally, after his contract expired in 2019, Zobrist called it a career, with 44.5 career F4, a 116 WRC+, three All-Star appearances, two World Series titles, and a World Series MVP. In his four-year peak from 2009 to 2012, Zobrist had a legitimate claim as the best position player in baseball, and in his 8-year peak from 2009 to 2016, he was one of the 10 best position players in the league. Obviously those timeframes are cherry-picked, but there are a ton of Hall of Famers that were never the best player in the league for a single season, let alone four. Zobrist won't be a Hall of Famer, but by Jaws, a measure of Hall of Fame worthiness based on career and peak war, he ranks 25th among all second basemen in baseball history. Zobrist's contributions to baseball go beyond his career numbers, though. While super utility players in the league had certainly existed before Zobrist, most were fringe major leaguers that couldn't hit a lick and were only stopgaps until somebody better could replace them full-time. They either improved and got a normal starting job, or were stuck as bench players for their career. The only notable exception was Tony Phillips, who I would say is Zobrist's most direct player comp, but Phillips didn't have the peak that Zobrist did and didn't change the way utility men were looked at across the league. Zobrist, and by extension Joe Madden's unique use of him, ushered in an era where positional flexibility was one of the most valuable skills a player could have, and even some of the biggest stars in the league learned different spots to set their team up for the most success on any given day. Today we see players like Cody Bellinger, Brandon Lau, and Javier Baez that are, in a sense, utility guys, while the utility players of yesteryear like David Fletcher and Chris Taylor are good enough hitters to sneak into a lineup almost every day. This change in the way utility guys were looked at was spearheaded by Zobrist, who will probably go down as the most successful utility guy of all time and maybe his most lasting impact on the sport. All this isn't even to mention he was arguably the best player in two straight World Series, making a lasting mark on two franchises. 
Ben Zobrist is remembered as a solid hitter and good team player, but he doesn't get the credit he deserves for his insane peak, his effect on team and lineup construction, and his postseason success. You can't tell the story of the last 10 plus years of baseball without Zobrist coming up at least a few times, which is something you can't say about many players. I'm not saying we should put Ben Zobrist in the Hall of Fame, but I am saying you should appreciate him more than you probably do. Thanks for sticking around, if you're liking the content, it helps me out a ton to like and subscribe, maybe check out my Twitter if you're interested in that. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.